and give you a thumbs up. Eh? Okay. Um, or I'll be at the pulpit probably. I welcome you all to Christ Baptist Church. My name is Nathan, a member of the church. Under the circumstances, it's not the easiest thing to say good morning, but it's always appropriate to say, I greet you all in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ, because our hope, even in death, is in him. So I greet you all and welcome. I would like to announce, first of all, that the body is here. So we will be playing a bit of background music just as the body comes in. And once that is done, we will carry on with the program and I will make other announcements subsequently. Welcome once again. Thank you. 
May we please stand. And as the body is being brought in, there'll be a one minute video playing. take our seats. Welcome once again, and especially to those who've just joined us in the last few minutes. We are here for the final send-off of our dear friend, um, colleague, and ultimately family, a husband, a father, a son himself. And it is not easy because when it comes to death, we always feel helpless because we can't seem to do anything about it, not only for our loved ones, but even for us. So it is indeed a sad moment. As has been mentioned in the video, we will indeed miss him even as we grieve. But there is somewhere where we can find hope as far as life and eternal life is concerned. So I believe it's appropriate for us to start with the scriptures where we find our hope and prayer. I will turn to Revelation chapter 21, and just listen as I read. I will read a few verses from verse 1. I'll pray, and we will begin our farewell. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, and for the, for the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there was no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he shall dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be among them. And he shall wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there shall no longer be any death. There shall no longer be any mourning or crying, or pain, the first things have passed away. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Right, for these words are faithful and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. Let us pray. Dear Lord, in such times we look to you because indeed there's nowhere else we can look, there's nowhere else we can turn. And in this time of grieving, we are reminded that there is indeed hope in you because one day, faithful to your promise, the first things will pass away and there'll be no more pain, no more death, no more mourning, no more crying. And we hold to this promise even as we send our loved one a final send-off for our loved one today, knowing full well that our hope in you is intact and that we may come to you for eternal life without cost. And so even as we grieve, we are hopeful because in the end, we shall meet again, not only with you, but with our brother as well. And I pray that those who do not know you also, Lord, may come to you without cost as they thirst and find these springs of water of life and that they may also share this joy, a joy that transcends even death. We pray all this, believing and trusting in your name, and that also you will give the family comfort and peace in these trying times, and that they will focus on you for this peace that surpasses human understanding, 
and that they'll be reminded of this great promise in you that even the last enemy, which is death, has been conquered by your work on the cross. And in this, we find hope, we find comfort, we find you. We pray all this believing and trusting in your name. Amen. As we get into the program, I'll just like to make a few announcements. First of all, especially for those who've joined us late, as far as the restrooms are concerned, you'll find them at the back, right? At the back of the building. If you just move on straight, you'll find the ladies and the gents there. And then as well behind us here, but more appropriately at the back there. And then as well, after everything is done, after we are done with the program, do not be in a hurry. Please stay behind. There'll be some snacks and a bit of fellowship afterwards. Okay, so please stay after the program. And if there's anything that you need, any question that you have, you may just ask me or even Nax, who's also a member of the church here, or Nathan, the other Nathan at the back there, and we will be able to help you. There's also Mr. Ramosa there and another church member, Mike. So feel free to consult us at any a point. At this point of the program, we would like to sing two songs, Amazing Grace and Whatever My God Ordains is Right. And then after that, I will welcome the preacher. This is congregational singing, so I invite you to stand on your feet as we are led in these two songs.
What if my God ordains is right? His only will abideth. I will be still whatever he does and follow where he guided. He is my God, do oh dark my road. He holds me that I shall not fall. And so to Him I leave it all. And so to Him I leave it all. What my God ordains is right. He never will deceive me. He leads me by the proper path. I know He will not leave me. I take content what He has sent. His hands can turn my griefs away. And patiently I wait His day. And patiently I wait His day. What am I, God ordains is right, though now this cup in drinking may be the same to my faint heart. I take it all and shrinking. My God is true each morning new, sweet comfort yet shall fill my heart. And pain and sorrow shall depart, and pain and sorrow shall depart. What am I, God ordains is right, he shall not stand be taken. To sorrow need no death be mine. Yet I am not forsaken. My Father's care is round me there. He holds me that I shall not fall. And so to Him I leave it all. And so to Him I leave it all. My Father's care round me down, He holds me that I shall not fall, and so to Him I leave it all, and so to Him I leave it all. Take your seats. At this point, I would like to invite Pastor Dave Bickley, the senior pastor of our church here. Pastor Dave.
Um, there we go. This is a privilege, privilege for me and us as Christ Baptist Church to serve. Uh, I remember just being told there was a family that came into the church a number of years ago by one of our pastors. I always happened to be across the ocean in America. And they said a Greek family came in. I said, really? Made me think of the passage in Scripture when one of the apostles came to, to Jesus said, the Greeks have come to see Jesus. And uh, I was excited because uh, I enjoy reading a Greek New Testament and came to meet Neophytos and his sons, Marco and Petrus. And we've enjoyed fellowship since. And because of that, and my conversations with Neophytos on Sundays after the sermon, he would have his Greek Bible and we would talk. Because of that, we are connected. We are connected. The Lord brought us together here and we are privileged, I am exceedingly privileged to actually be able to share as we do every time we can meet the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Especially here to what I would just say, new friends and connections. Yes, it is a sad occasion, but the wisest man who ever lived up to Jesus Christ a historical man, we know him as King Solomon. King Solomon wrote this down for us all to hear till the end of time. A good name is better than good ointment, and the day of one's death is better than the day of one's birth. Well, a good name is better than good ointment. We see that here today. It is better to go to a house of mourning than to go to a house of feasting because that is the end of every man and the living takes it to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter for when a face is sad, a heart may be happy. The mind of the wise is in the house of mourning while the mind of the fools is in the house of pleasure. You see, this is a very sad time for us because we are eternal beings. Every one of us here, no matter where you come from, no matter what your culture, no matter what you've brought up, been, how, how you've been brought up, you are an eternal being. Everything else goes to the dust. Our bodies go to the dust, but we know our souls last forever. We know this. Why do we know this? Because we're here. Show me anything else on this planet other than people who gather to take the time to reflect. Show me anything. In this entire universe, where reflection is taken upon death, we do. Why? Because God has set eternity into our hearts so that we will not know the end from the beginning. We don't know how it began, and we don't know exactly how it will end inside of us, but we know there is an eternity. And we look at the stars and we wonder. And we look here at a tragedy and wonder. Because we know it does not end with this. We know that. It is self-evident. Because we are made in the image of God, we are different than everything else on this planet and in this universe. That is true. That is true no matter where you are from, it is true for all people. We know this. And because we are in a house of mourning, we reflect. You see, if we had a big cake and we were at a wedding, we'd be thinking about eating and rejoicing and drinking and all of that, and no one would be thinking. We would be very emotional, led by that. But we're not. We're led now to reflect. And what we see here is a tragedy, for sure. 
so quick in a prime of life. But if we were to go back and look at thousands of years of history, is this the only injustice? The answer is no. The actual answer is every death is an injustice. We were not made to die. But because this earth is cursed because of rebellion against God, we now live in an uncertain world with uncertain times and tragedy strikes and unevenly. It does not strike the same for every family. Births don't even occur evenly in the same families. So where's our hope? If that's true, and we know it is, we know it is. Even in this last year, why does COVID strike some and not others? See, we reflect. And if that is the world we live in, what is our hope? Is this just God really wanting to create just anguish amongst his people? We have an answer. And it's an answer by our Lord Jesus Christ, who came as God, who lowered himself as a man, becoming born in this society as a human being with a human mother and a heavenly father, so that he would live amongst us, not to show us the way, not to be an example, not to be a prophet, but to be a sacrifice in the greatest injustice that would ever happen so that we would have hope. He knew that this is a world of chaos and he came and submitted himself so that we can get through this chaos and have hope. I want to read a few verses of what he said to us that give us this hope. I'm privileged because I get to read it first in a way that Neophytos would understand it and hear it. Me tarasestho humon, he cardia, pistuite eis ton theon, Kai ace ime pestuite. I find it also fitting just even to mention here that our gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ is written in the Greek language. Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. You see, their hearts were troubled. from the Greek word tarasso, troubled, shaken, very disturbed, angry, not understanding. Could it happen to me? Where do we go? Do not let your heart have this. Reflect. Yes. We've seen something happen here that we feel is an injustice in life because it wasn't a long debilitating disease. It was life in the world. And what happened? Our world just got rocked. Do not let your heart be troubled at all. The one who was suffering and attacked more than any other person because he said these words about how God is reaching down to provide hope for us. Believe in God. We know that. There's not a human being on this planet who doesn't know that God exists. They have a picture of him in their mind. They might be angry. They might be happy of this figment in their mind of God. But here. They've painted him, but they know there is something else because we're made that way. Believe in God. 
But Jesus is not telling us, believe in God. My message today is not believe in God. Why? Because the, the Bible tells us the demons believe in God and tremble. From the Greek word there, friso, where we get our English word refrigerator. The demons believe and turn to ice. That's what they think about God. They believe for sure. But that's it. What does Jesus say in verse 1? He says, believe in God. We got that covered, folks. But believe also in me. That's what's new. He walked with 12. Why should we believe in you? We've been with you. We've seen you do amazing things. You, you fed 10,000 out of a basket of bread. You you walked on water. We've seen you heal. You're just amazing in how you do it. You must be a great prophet. Believe in me. You must believe in God for sure. And he is a God who is described as a consuming fire. But he's also described as love. He's described as justice. He's described as a father. What do I believe about God? I can't handle it right because we cannot see with our earthly eyes because we're spiritually dead and we're born spiritually dead. He says, believe in God, believe also in me. What are we to believe about Jesus? Because this is his command. You must believe also in me. Well, I'll just give you three simple things that Jesus told us right here. In John chapter 14, verses 1 to 6. And one, that he is all about life. We have no life without Jesus. And I'm not saying your life won't be joyful. I'm not saying your life won't be good. Oh, there's, there's many people who were born in rich families and live in Europe and across the globe, and they do what they want to do, and their kids go do whatever they want to do. My life is great. Is it because of Jesus? No. That's not good. That's a, that's a time frame where people get to play like at a... Like at a wedding, they're not reflecting. Life is, what do you do with your eternity? Because right here, right here in this room, right on this earth, however we live, whether it is whether it's one year, as some babies understand, or whether it is 20, cut down just before the prime of life, or in 40, 50, 60, or even 80, 90, it doesn't matter. As we live this life, imagine going to a large feast. This is the starter. This is the starter right here. No matter how many years it is, it's the starter. And depending on who you're aligned with, in eternity, you either go to a famine or a feast. But life here is a starter, which means everybody eats something. Might be unfair. Some people get a salad and other people get the shrimp. But at the end of it, the star goes away. And now, is there a big feast or is there a famine? It depends on whether you are alive or not. That's the key. Do you have life? Jesus said in verse 2, In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would not have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. This is, this is how he's the life. He's the life in saying, first, we all understand God. He has many rooms in his house. Many rooms. Many places. Whose name goes on which door? We don't know. But we do know this. He has many rooms. And he has an abundance of what he wants to provide. That's my father. And if it were not so, I would have told you. Jesus doesn't have to really tell them it's so because they already knew that, but if it were a lie, he would tell them. And here's what he says. Since my father's house has many dwelling places, many rooms, for I go to prepare a place for you. I go. Jesus goes. What does he mean when he says, I go? 
It means I'm going to die. It means I die and I will go to my father. But how can he go to his father if he dies? Because he resurrects. You see, he beat death. He is the one man, the one man who we have proof and we know that he didn't die and stay dead. He raised from the dead. I go to my father to prepare a place. I go there. And I'm working when I'm there. He doesn't go there to sit with his father and now watch us struggle in life. If you feel that, you don't understand how God gave us his word so we can know that there's hope. We know that. So we can look here and say, ah, but I have hope. It's not over yet. I don't let this, this custom, this ritual, this funeral crush me down because why? I know we have one who has gone and preparing a place and I believe in him, trusting in him so that he'll have a room for me and I have hope that this is not the end. And my only hope at my funeral will be I trust that I've had some kind of a relational impact on people that they'll be glad to come to remember. But then it's gone. Because I have an eternity waiting. And he is our life. Because he resurrected, the Bible tells us we can resurrect. Which means this... This does not hold us. You see? We look at a coffin to say death is real. We spend most of our life trying to run away from it, for sure. Nobody likes a funeral, but the wisest man who ever lived said it's the best thing to happen. So you can think. Because this is real. For sure. But it's not the end. That's what's real. The world would say it's over. No hope done let's bury what hope is that that's, that's there's no hope there that is sadness but i can look and say this coffin will not hold i know that's true because he has gone to prepare a place he is the life and it's jesus christ not anything else jesus even condemned his jewish teachers, his rabbis, as he spoke to them in John chapter 5, verse 39, you search the scriptures because you think in them you have life. Uh-oh, what's coming next? They thought, yeah, I searched the scriptures. I know the scriptures really well. And then he just said that one little phrase, and you think in them you have life. <laughs> but these scriptures are what speak about me because I give life, and you will not come to me to have life. You see, you have all the ingredients for, for, to make a meal, but you refuse to give it to the chef to make the meal. Just knowing the Bible doesn't help you at all. Knowing the Bible points you to Jesus, and you realize Jesus is the one who died in your behalf so that you do not suffer the wrath of God, and then you have his life. You don't have your own life. God doesn't just give you life. He doesn't just give you eternal life. He gives you the life of Christ, his son. He gives that to you. We have life because he prepares a place for us. Secondly, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. You see, this is the truth we need. We need a truth to get us through this life. It is very, very difficult right now, especially for those of the Neophytos family. Very difficult. They feel something that as we move further away from the family unit, it's, it's, we're sad, but we don't feel what they feel, that weight, that 10-ton that, that anvil that's just pressing on us. It's what I felt when I lost my parents.
What makes that anvil weigh nothing? Truth. Not, not any kind of idea in my own imagination. Not something that I want to be true. Not something that I imagine. That does nothing. I need truth. I need something that's solid. And God gave us his word right here. He gave us something that would we can hold him to and say, you can't change. He didn't just give us something that was passed down over the years so that some prophet somewhere, somebody said something, and who knows if it would change or not. He didn't do that. He wrote it down to where we have right here, and I've got my Greek New Testament, 25,000 copies of this all the way back from the days of the apostles so that we can have it and verify it and know that it's true. And he said, now hold me to that. And what does Jesus say? Well, since I go and prepare a place for you, that's what I said I'm doing, I will come again and receive you. So that where I am, there you may be also. That's the truth. I will come again. He didn't just go away to heaven to stay there and to be in heaven and watch us. He's working and preparing something now, I can get excited about that, and that helps override my problems of injustice on this earth. It helps me get away from the news. It helps me get away from the personal hurt that I know the Neofitu family is suffering. Truth will say, wow, that, is, that really is something that actually encompasses this grief and makes this grief short-lived, and God is gracious to give me memories, memories of my father, memories of my brother, memories of my friend, memories that will last our lifetime. God gives us that. And that's why you have hope, knowing that when you leave, what about those who are left behind? They have memories that you can actually facilitate and make sure that happens. Because we can be excited right now about knowing that Jesus is working and preparing for those who are his. He's not preparing for all. He's not preparing for all people. This is not for humanity to move from earth to heaven. This is for those who have placed their trust in Christ to know that he has died on the cross for my sins, who have grieved an angry God, and, and the Son of the Father was given as a sacrifice so that the Father can be happy with me. Why? Because I have Christ's life, and he takes my life. You see, that's called atonement. That called, that, that's called a satisfaction of a sacrifice. He was a sacrifice. God placed him there on the cross. Not the Romans, not the Jews. God the Father delivered his Son for us so that we would have his life which raised from the dead, and he would have ours, which is going to a famine, oblivion, judgment. And he gave that to us. And he is coming back to receive his own who have new life in Christ. Because there is no life without Christ. Jesus said in John 17, verse 3, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the living God. So you must know the Father like a father, not the figment of your imagination. How do we get that? Christ gives you new eyes to see, this is my Father you're adopted in. Christ gives us all life to live for eternity. He raised from the dead, so we get his resurrection to raise. This is the truth. that he is going to come and receive us to himself. If you have trusted in him to change your life from dead to alive. Literally, that's what the Bible says so many times, from death to life. Well, we're here reflecting on death. And what we hope for and want to hear is life. That's what the Bible tells us. And lastly, lastly, after Jesus talks about really being our life, 
and is the embodiment of the truth we need. The disciples asked him a question after Jesus said, and you know the way I am going. You know. After he told them in the first three verses, believe in God and believe also in me. My father's has room, ha house has many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. And I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you to myself. And where I am, there you may be also. And now you know the way that I'm going, which is going to be the way of the cross, the way of death, the way of resurrection, and ascending to his Father. You know the way I'm going. He's telling them this. And Thomas, the Bible doesn't say this, but we say this. We call him Doubting Thomas. Good old Thomas, he's, he, he's a guy that says, if, if Thomas has hope, maybe I have hope, <laughs> because I have doubts at times. Good Thomas, who speaks for the group. Lord, we do not know where you are going. We, how do we know the way? You're talking all this difficult spiritual talk, Jesus. I don't know the way. I'm kind of suspicious here. We just saw Lazarus raised from the dead. I didn't understand that thing at all. I'm kind of scared. But Lord, we don't know where you're going. How do we know the way? And here's what Jesus said. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. That's pretty clear. I am the way. That's why you don't know the way. You can't find the way. You can't find a way to God. You cannot make your way to God. You cannot get to be with God as your father. So you're right. Because you cannot find the way to God, he is your enemy. And while you live on this earth as children trying to stand up to something you know nothing about, you shake your fist at God. I'll just get angry at him. Ha, huh, how about that? Not knowing there is a massive judgment in eternity waiting at that fist. Because that's the way you think it is to God. I will stand up to him. Well, that's just immaturity. That's, that's, that's ignorance. That's, that's being spiritually dead, not connected to God and knowing God. Thomas is saying, I don't know the way. How do I get to God? He says, I am the way. Don't look for the way. Don't try to find the way. I am the way. Myself. Because if you connect in with me, I give you my life. And I'll take yours. That's the way. You see, then you live in the newness of life. You have my heart beating in you. Which means this life for you, whenever that is, whenever God has appointed the day of judgment, the Bible tells us every single person has an appointed day. We can do nothing about it. And when the day comes, the Father looks and says, Ah, the life of Christ beating in this one. Come, I have a room. I have a place. Because it's the life of Christ that we need in us. I am the way. I'm the truth. And the life. That's what Jesus said. Believe in God and believe also in me. What do we believe about Jesus? That he is the life, the truth, and the way. He even said that. And he summarized it to make it clear. I am. And because of that, we have hope here. We are reflecting because of such an untimely death. Such a tragedy for a family that I'm so just looking at the grace of God at how Many people in this small little town in South Africa could come together and say, how do we help the Neofitu family? That's a grace, isn't it? Because of relationship that's happened over decades. A family is not alone. So we don't worry at all now. Neofitos is, he's left the starter and it's now on to the rest of eternity. That's going to happen for all of us. All of us. And while we are here, what a grace to see. While we're in this place of a starter, we are together. We're together. 
and that surely is a grace of God. Mm. But while we're here, this is why we contemplate. Without Christ, there's horror, emptiness, famine. With Christ, it's more than you can ever think, believe, or even ask. It's more than that. Because that's how good God is and what he wants to give. So, me tara sesto humon he cardia, pistuite eis ton theon, kai eis eme pistuite, let your hearts not be troubled. Believe in God and believe also in me. And for that, we have hope. Let's just pray. Father, we thank you for your word. The goodness that you give to us, the relationship that we had, albeit so short here at Christ Baptist Church, to know the Neophyto family, having, having met them, engaged with them, and now they're just allowing us to share the gospel here. But we do pray for them as you continue to give your grace to the living. And pray, Lord, that your message here from your word is effectual of Christ and what he has done and your goodness to all of humanity. In Christ's name, amen. Thank you, Pastor Dave, for those great words of comfort. At this point, we'd like to sing one more congregational song. So I'd invite you to please stand onto your feet. It is well with my soul. It is 
peace well with my soul. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glory. take your seats. At this point in the program, I would just like to invite Marco and Petros as well. And Marco and Petros will be giving the tribute. And also after the tribute, Marco will read the eulogy and then Petros will give thanks. So Marco and Petros, please come. Good morning, family. Good morning, families. I mean, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, families and friends. I would like to thank you on behalf of our father and the Neofitu family for coming here today to support us and share this sad, tragic moment in and chapter in our lives with us. I would like to thank our family and friends who stood by us on the day of our father's passing and who have continued to stand by us even afterwards and still to this day. It is with our deepest sorrow that unfortunately many people who wanted to come today to see our father off for one last time couldn't come due to restrictions put in place because of current circumstances with this pandemic. Some of you who couldn't make it today due to these restrictions may be watching the memorial on live stream today. And for those who are, we thank and salute you for your ongoing support in the sad times. I would also like to thank everyone who called us, came to check in on us, message us and convey their deepest sympathies to us in any other form of media or message for your condolences. 
Our father's passing was a shockwave that was like a shockwave that hit our community. After all, he was very much, by, much loved by many and was also like a father, a brother, and the best of friends to many people. He was kind-hearted, loving, and compassionate. He was a kind-hearted, loving, and compassionate man, and nobody ever left his company feeling unwelcome or without their hearts being touched. Myself and my brother can only hope to be the man that he once was and still is, and to fill his shoes, which will be very difficult and an immense task. This we will do the best we can to continue his legacy, which he left behind to us. To tell you how much we loved our dad, we cannot describe it in words. All we can say is that if myself or my brother could give everything we had in our lives just to have one more year, one more day, one more minute with him, we would do it a million times over without thinking twice. Because of how much we loved, adored, and idolized him with all our hearts and souls. Finally, I would like to thank God for giving us such a good and loving Father who did his best for us, guided us, raised us, who helped shape our future, and for the time that we have spent with our Father all these years of our lives. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody, and again, on behalf of my father and family, I'd just like to thank everyone for coming, for the ongoing support in this time of our loss, and for being an ongoing support to us. Um, I think I would rather read the eulogy first. Because I don't maybe know if I'll be able to speak after the message. I won't necessarily be given a speech, but I'll rather be reading a message from us that you guys can follow along with in the pamphlets that you were given. But to read the eulogy, I will begin now. Neofitus Neofitu, also known as Fitus, was born on the 5th of May 1964 in the village known as Ios Fiodoros on the island Cyprus was the youngest sibling of six children, being the only brother. He grew up loving every single member of his family, and at the age of 10, the family was forced to flee to the southern part of the island due to a war that broke out between Cyprus and Turkey. At the age of, at the age of 23, on the 23rd of October 1987, he immigrated to South Africa to live with the Kutas family and work with the father of the household, Uncle Alex Kutas. Since then, he has spent the next 34 years in South Africa running many of his own businesses, enjoying time with his family and riding his motorbikes. His passion was his family and to always be with his two sons, Petrus and Marco. Over the years, he has built the strongest of bonds and friendships that have lasted over a lifetime. Many people will have known him for his loving kindness, compassion, and willingness to help all of those around him. He has built a legacy that none of us could possibly forget. We will always love him for who he was and cherish the years spent with him as they have been nothing but a privilege to all of us. Now, on to the message. It is uh, on behalf of me and Petros, so you can... Read the message of my mother also over there. Um, I will just read the our message that we have given. Dad, we will always love you as you loved us. We will never forget the time spent with you on many occasions, and especially these. Good 
these recent years working with you, which pulled us even closer together. We could not ask for a better father, nor could we ask for a more loving father who lived his life with and for us. We cannot thank you enough for how you have prepared us for all the events of our lives to be able to stand tall and strong on our feet, even for a time like this when you said there would come a time and a day where you would no longer be here with us, losing you our loss of everything. We will never forget you, nor will we forsake the bond the three of us had, as well as a bond that will continue forever. I could not be more happy and proud to call myself your son, and I know Petrus will say the exact same. It is an honor. I wish we could have more time together, as these are the happiest days of you. We hope and wait confidently that having placed hope alone in Jesus Christ, our eternal Lord and Savior from our sins, that we will meet with you again in paradise to be with our Lord forever. Petros, will you please come and give the thanks? Okay, hello everybody again. We would like to thank a few people specifically, a few families specifically. Some names we cannot we cannot mention that. At the end of the day, our father knew thousands of people. So to stand and mention each and every family name, it's going to be very difficult. But I will be mentioning a few, okay? We would like to thank Kuta's family, also known as our cousins, the family that brought our father to South Africa. We would like to thank you for bringing our father here because with if you didn't bring our father here, we wouldn't be around. We wouldn't exist. We would like to thank the Baradas family and the Fox family for being with us also in this difficult time together with the Kutas family, for supporting us, checking in on us, and looking out for us. We would also like to thank the Fletcher family, those who unfortunately couldn't be here today but are here and strong, to support us and also check in on us in this very difficult time. We would also like to thank the Moti family for coming in. They, they are our neighbors, by the way. They came in to check on us a lot also. The Tayob family. We would like to thank everybody here in general. We would like to also thank Yes, this is just too much, you know, too much families, you know, it's, but we thank you all for coming and supporting us and for being here with us. And we also would like to thank Uncle Oliver on a personal note also for coming and staying with us this week. We thank you all and we love you all. Thank you very much. And thanks for sharing this moment with us.
Knox and Daniel are ready for the recessional song as we begin to close the program. But before they do so, I'd just like to pray. Um, and after I pray, just as we pay our last respects to our brother, I would ask us all to stand after I pray, as we pay our last respects, as our brother is being led away, and we have the recessional music. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we are grateful for the message that has come to us because in an intensely grievous time, what we want more than anything is hope. And indeed, we have been pointed to the great hope, not just believing in God, but in Christ, who brings us eternal life. Indeed, the way, the truth, and the life, who has gone to prepare a way for us all. And we pray that this great hope will resonate with us all as we consider where our brother is now and where we should all hope to be. And that this will not be just a time of mourning, but a time of reflection and accepting this great hope that we have in you and indeed only you. We are grateful to you. And even amidst a time of grief, you indeed knowing full well what it means to taste death, having died, but even as that's been preached, you did not remain dead, for you rose on the third day victorious, conquering even what Paul calls the last enemy. And so we are grateful that in you we find life, life eternal, and that we can boldly proclaim, proclaim that one day indeed, as has been read by Marco, we will meet with our brother once again. And in this we rejoice, O Lord, as we even had sung amazing grace truly, and it is well indeed with our soul, for those who know you, and that, that is what we pray, that the message will not be in vain, but according to your promise, it will bear fruit in our hearts and indeed cause us to turn to you, especially those who do not know you, O oh Lord. For the family, we continue to pray for this peace and comfort that surpasses human understanding and that indeed you will provide it as you are faithful to your promise, as you continue to remind us that indeed one day you will return. And we pray all this believing and trusting in your great name, Lord. Amen. Please let us stand to our feet as the recession begins. And once again, as I had announced earlier, I invite you not to leave quickly, but to stay behind, share some fellowship amongst each other, and also some snacks.
thank you all for coming. This concludes our program. And once again, please join us outside for some fellowship and some snacks. Thank you.